this week we get another exciting Hebrew letter. And this one is exciting. This one's good. I actually had some mind-blowing things happen while I was researching this letter. And so uh, this was done at the very last minute with the, you know... The reason it was done at the last minute is because it just, it just kept on going and going and going. In fact, your notes are a little bit different than the screen because I, the last minute means I changed something on the back. And so you, the last one, I'll, I'll show you where it's at. You'll, you'll want to um, change what you have in your notes there if you want to write down what I have up here. Otherwise, you can keep what you have in your notes. It's okay, but it's not as good as what I changed it to. So. I, I know. It's, the, the sermon's never done until it comes out of my mouth. And even then, it could change. So, so we'll, we'll review up until this point. So as you know, the Hebrew alphabet uh, is every letter ha- has a symbol. And what I've come to find out over the course of this is that there is something that you'll see within the life and ministry of Jesus that actually goes back to one of these letters. And it, and it reveals some truths that are just profound. So we know that he didn't slap this whole thing together uh, at the last minute. That these things were planned, they were ordained. And when you see the connection from beginning to end, that's why we're going through this. We're not going through this just because we want to be, uh, you know, learn Hebrew and think we're smart. We're going through it because it says something about the way God put this stuff together. And when we understand how he did it, then we understand that this just wasn't a mistake. This wasn't happenstance. This happened for a reason. The reason that God wrote the Bible in Hebrew, the reason he grew up a people that would take his word to, to the rest of of us is so that he could he could have these amazing things put in there and I'm always amazed that when people start looking at the Bible they'll look at it and they'll pick it apart and I've noticed this for a while they'll pick it apart over things that are just it's, it's, it's not really fair but guess what God, God put his word together and it's an amazing thing if you take the time to look into it. But if you don't take the time to look into it, you'll just go, ah, it's just another book and just pass it on by. It's kind of like you're going through, you're going through and you're looking for something. You don't know what you're looking for and you pass by the thing that has the answer thinking that's not it. And it's almost like God did that on purpose. Like he said, I'm going to put a people on the earth and you're just going to pass by him and think that they're not it. I'm going to put a Messiah on the planet and you're just going to pass by him and think that it's not him. I'm going to write these things down in my word and you're just going to look over it and think that's not the case. And you're going to toss it away. But those who really seek after me, those who really want to find me, will find this book, will see what's in it, and will unlock its secrets and those are the people I'm going to share things with. I mean, that's really an amazing thing because most of the time when you go to advertising, they go, look at this, this is what it is, this is amazing, don't you want it? And you're like going, hey, no, get away, right? But God's going like, this is it, but you're probably not interested in it. <laughs> That's what he's doing. And then he'll go take it away. You don't want to know this stuff, do you? Oh, really? You think, you, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. But that's what he does, right? And so that's what this is. This is like, ah, oh, this is just the alphabet. This is just, that doesn't, you could just discount all of this. Or you could really see the amazing things that are underneath the surface. So hopefully, if you can go through this with me, uh, bear with it. If, if your eyes start to glaze over and, the, and it gets a little too choppy, I'm going to bring it together at the end, okay? And then all those things that I explain will go like, oh, and the light bulb will go on. Hopefully, if I did it right, we'll see. So here's a little bit of the review. Every letter has a picture, meaning, a number, a value, and it has a modern look, and then it has its name. So here's the Aleph. It means the first strong leader. Name is the Olive. Here's the picture. This is the floor plan of a tent or a house. Number two, value two. There's the modern, and the name is Bait. Uh, there's the. This is a foot. It means to lift up or exalt, or and a gimel, which is actually a gamel, which is a camel. So they are. They have feet too, right? Okay. A dalit, tent flap or door, and there's the name of it. Hey, uh, look, or it's a window. Hey, a vav. Everybody know what the vav is? That's a nail. Okay, God. I heard it. I thought I heard it. Okay. Uh, Zion, that's a sword or a plow. Zion, that's a fence or inner chamber, also known as a chet, which has got the funny uh, guttural ch. Uh, a, that's a, a basket, it means to surround. It, also, it actually means what's inside. Uh, 
the letter today actually means more to surround, and I'll show you how that is. So I might have to go back and change this one a little bit, but it's the tet, the number nine, and the yud, which is an arm. That's where you get the word yard, yada, a yadam. I guess you're from the northeast, right? Yadam. Okay. Okay, flat. There's crickets. Okay. Uh, palm of the hand. Uh, now it's changing. The number's 11. And that's what you call an ordinal number. That means what order it comes in. And then the value is 20. Kaf. Palm of the hand. You go, everybody goes, well, why is there only four fingers? You know, I got five right here. Ah, the palm of the Like that. See? Four. Okay. Lamed. It's a staff or a goad. Right? It means to learn, to uh, instruct. It's a lamed. And that uh, represents the number 30. A mem, which is water. Right? Mem. And uh, that number is a 40. It's 13th in line, but it's 40. And the ordinal number has a meaning, and the, and, the, and the value has a meaning. And you're going to see both of those today with this letter. This is a sprout or a fish. Right? So this is number 14, and it is also the number of 50. It's, 50 is also the number of freedom, because it's 7 times 7 is 49. The next one's 50. And so you get life on 50. That's great, right? So for those of you who haven't hit 50 yet, life has not begun, really. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and so we have a. Uh, this is this is the ancient pictograph. Now this is the most mysterious letter. You, you you try and research this letter, and people go, "Well, it's a support." See, people th think like uh, it's like a crutch. It's like a you lean on it like a support. Uh, people think that. Uh, they also think that. Um, trying trying to think others. They have all sorts of interesting ways of, of what this means. But this is the most ancient form of the letter. As it comes around, it becomes a circle, right? But uh, the ancient symbol is like a thorn or like a lattice. Like you're going you're gonna to build something and put it together. It's like a little construction project is what it is. And uh, the number of this one is 15 and the value is 60. Uh, see, now it looks kind of like a circle. You know, this one kind of looks like a doll, you know, like an ancient doll, but it's supposed to be like circular. That's kind of stylized. And you say the letter like Samech, Samech, with a, with a Chet on the end, right? So that is the letter. No, I'm sorry. It's not a, it's not a Chet. It's a Chaf. My mistake. It's a Chaf. So um, it's Samech with that on the end. You don't have to say it. You can say Samech if you want, if that's easier. And... Uh, we're going to go over our little sentence that we're building. The first strong leader built a house to show his generosity, that's the gimel, to those in need. That's a dalut, or uh, one who stands by the door, the dalit. In order that he might behold, hey, see, and become connected to, by the, by the nail, to the sword of his word, because every word that comes out of your mouth is like a sword, you know, it cuts both ways, and so that they may be brought into his inner chamber. This is, um, in my father's house are many inner rooms, that's this right here, to be enclosed, I had surrounded there, but to be enclosed by his goodness through his mighty arm and outstretched palm. To instruct us through the chaos and give us life, then sustain and support us. Right? And so we're going to talk about the sustain. How does God sustain and support us? What did he do in order to sustain and support us? This is all talking about what happened with the Samech. But before we get that, we're going to explain... Uh, now, these are all little short things that I'm going to explain what the Samech is in these little instances. And then uh, we'll put it all together. So here's the letter Samech. It comes, you know, we're past the midpoint now. After this, we've got seven letters left. You know, we've got a week of letters left. That's it. Um, so, introduction. Uh, the Samech is the 15th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The Samech is like a thorn branch. The Samech means to support or sustain. Right? And that's the noon. Oh, you might think that's a mistake, and it is a little bit, but the noon. Now, there's something interesting. It comes noon samech, right? And that's how it is in the alphabet. Right here, we have a noon and a samech. The interesting thing is, is this is actually a word in Hebrew. It's nes, nes. The word nes means that um, it's actually nes is the word for miracle. So the one who is alive and supported is a miracle, right? 
So the new represents coming to life. So you have Nei Samech, and that's a miracle. So one who has bowed before God, one who is humble before God, living life in the Lord, that you're a walking, talking miracle of God. So that's always that's that's not from me either. That's that's a, a known thing in the in the Alpe. So here it is. Now you can see there's the there's the here's the modern letter, and this is kind of like a this right here is kind of like. Uh, a Phoenician way. This is a uh, online. If you go to Wikipedia, you'll see this one come up. But then, see, you'll see that the earliest form of the letter is this: the three, the three lines and the support, right? So you have, you have. It's kind of like a framework, right? Like supporting. So here, and then it starts to in the late 400 BC. You have this little open-ended character. And then here, we've got the circle here. So up here, it's like a circle, a samech. Which is interesting that it's a circle now because an ayin is more actually more like a circle. If you go back in the ancient text, an ayin is like a circle. So, and that's the next letter, which is uh, also interesting. But I, I bought uh, like a thorn branch, like you kind of woven them together, right? And I'm going to actually now what I'm going to say here is something that that when I look at the letter and I and you know a little bit about the ancient practice and you kind of connect it with the Bible you can see how this uh, could make sense but this is by no means like there's no papers written on this people wonder why the thorn is connected with the Samech when the Samech means to surround but the Samech is not necessarily a thorn but it has something to do with thorns well here's I'm going to show you something that's kind of interesting a thicket of thorns what could you use a thicket of thorns for? What do people use a thicket of thorns for? Well, check this out. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Hey, maybe if somebody could hit that light, maybe we could... Yeah, Leonard's got it. Who's going to win? Leonard can Okay. There he goes. Is that a little better? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So you can see these guys. These are... These are little African boys. This is about the age that you go and you start becoming a herdsman or a shepherd, right? And so this right here, I don't know if you can tell, but you can see right here that we have all of these supports. Look at that. See these supports here? And they've driven those things into the ground. And the reason that they've driven these things into the ground is that they want to, um, uh, they're going to make a little enclosure. They're going to surround something here. And, uh, and you'll see that these are the thorns or branches. These can be made of thorns or branches. Now why would you build something like this? Well, you build something like this because you're going to keep animals in and safe, and you're going to keep lions and tigers and predators out, right? So you'll have, so if they want to get to them, they're going to have, get a mouthful of thorns first, right? So it's, it's a way to protect uh, the herd. And so this surrounds, see, this, this surrounds. And so this is an explanation why a samech might mean to surround and have something to do with thorns. Um, you'll see lots of ancient enclosures. And you can bring up the lights a little bit if you'd like. You can see lots of ancient enclosures. They, they have this. In fact, uh, this is a real biblical thing. When Jesus said, I'm the gate for the sheep, when, I, when we talked about the Dalit, we talked about that verse. Well, there's an entrance to this uh, tent, and sometimes they're built out of stone. Sometimes they'd be built out of stone, and then thorns would be put around them right in order to keep things away because they're going to keep the sheep safe inside and then the shepherd would sit at the doorway said I am the gate anything coming in through here is going to come through me so it has the idea of protection of sustaining of surrounding of making safe right of keeping from harm and so that's a thicket of thorns that's kind of like the idea behind the samech so there's some words that have to do with samech and they have to do with Guess what? Sustaining and supporting. Okay, yeah. So these words support, sustain, and to lay hands on. Right? If you're gonna if you're gonna lay hands on somebody, you know what we do? Like someone comes up for prayer and we lay hands on them. What are we doing? We're supporting them in prayer, aren't we? We still do this stuff. It's almost like why do we do it? Because we see it in Scripture. Where did Scripture get it? Right here. Right? So support, sustain, and lay hands on. And so all of that is the actual word samech, and I put the samech in uh, yellow there so you can see that it comes at the beginning of the word. That is uh, the letter samech, and that's what samech means. And then you have a shelter, a sukkah. What I just showed you was like what? It was like a sukkah. It was like a temporary dwelling place for animals. That's a sukkah, right? So sukkah or sukkah, that is a shelter. Here's another one. Thicket. When, when we talk about a thicket of thorns or something, that's a sovech. A sovech, right? It begins with 
Samech. Right? Uh, order. We're going to have one of these here in a little bit. It's a seder or a seder. And a seder means to put in order, which means that it's going to be, you're going to be supporting, right, what's, what's happening. It's a way to do something and to give it some support, some structure, and some order. You're going to give it uh, a seder. And if you want to say that you're okay in Hebrew, you say best seder. That means everything's in order. Thank you. Right? So authority. Uh, smicha is authority in Hebrew, right? So what does that mean? In order to get smicha, someone has to put their hand, lay their hands on you and ordain you to give you authority to speak on what? On behalf of the organization, on behalf of God, on behalf of... You, you have now become one of like a shepherd, right? But not a shepherd of sheep, but a shepherd of people. Right? God called all of Israel's teachers shepherds. There's good shepherds and there's bad shepherds. He goes, I'm the good shepherd. Some of those guys are teaching, they're bad shepherds. Why are they bad shepherds? Because they're not the sedeh. They're not in order. Right? They've got things out of order. It's not that you have things wrong, they're just out of order. So since it's out of order, it's not supported in Scripture. Right? You, are you getting the idea? So smicha, smicha. Now, I know these words are Hebrew and they're kind of foreign and you're kind of going, okay, there's a lot of different things here. But the reason I, I went through this little thing, some of those things is, uh, we're going to come back to the sukkah and the seder, and, uh, or in English we say seder, right? Uh, but this, this word here, smicha, smicha is something that's very interesting and it happens in the Bible. Now, we're going to be talking about the smicha of Jesus. You know, if Jesus is going to come and do an earthly ministry, he has to be ordained. Well, who's going to ordain Jesus? Who's going to ordain the Messiah? Well, we see his ordination right here. Uh, it says, now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, he was praying. And the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. And so Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age. Huh, that's interesting. He's about 30 years of age. What letter is 30? I believe that's a Lamed, isn't it? <laughs> okay. So he started teaching at 30 when it's Lamed age? Okay, okay, just checking. So, you are my beloved son with you. I'm well pleased. So what's going on here? Well, we have two witnesses. Now, in order to be ordained, everything under heaven and earth must be established by the witness of two or three witnesses here. Well, we have, we have two, but technically you could say three, because you have, you have John, right, who baptized him. Uh, and, and I use a shortened verse here. In a, in a more expanded version, uh, in one of the Gospels, it says, Me baptize you, you should be baptizing me. And, and so instead of that happening... She said, we must do this to fulfill all righteousness. So we know that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. But Jesus wasn't repenting of anything because he had no sin. So what was he doing? It's an ordination. He's being, this, this is an ordination for ministry. So then John, knew, oh, you're not coming for my bapti baptism. You're coming for another reason. It's a, different, it's a different baptism. In Hebrew, the word is mikvah. mikvah. There's a different reason for this mikvah. And it's not because... You need to repent of your sins and become washed with water and become clean. That's what we do when we do a baptism, right? It's to ordain you into service, right? You're about to begin your ministry. Okay, I see that. And so, so in order for Jesus to say anything about the commandments or anything at all, he must be ordained, right? And at the time of Jesus... Uh, there are two. There are actually two uh, types of ordination. Uh, one type of ordination is uh, you could be a Lord of the Torah. That's Baal Torah, and that is to uh, you know and you have the first five books of the the mem uh, of the Bible memorized of the Tanakh of the of the of the Law of the Prophets and the Writings. Um, that's the first five books, of the Torah. And once you know those, you can then say that you are a Lord of the Torah. But you cannot explain what the Torah means. You can say, well, this rabbi said this, and this rabbi said that, and this rabbi said that, and this is what it says. You know, I know it. Very good, you know it. Well, Jesus said he spoke, when we're going to get to it, 
he taught with authority. Well, in order to teach with authority and to garner disciples for yourself, you needed to have the Tanakh memorized. And that is the entire canon of, of, of Scripture at the time of Jesus uh, would have been committed to memory, right? And in order to get ordination, to get smicha, to be ordained, to have authority, um, and this is a big thing. Like if you go and you and even day, today, and I was I was looking online. You, you have a smicha online, and sometimes it says, says semicha. Uh, I've heard it pronounced uh, smicha anyway. That's the way I do it. But um, you know, you have smicha classes, right? Why? That's ordination classes, right? And oh, well, where did you get your smicha from? Well, my smicha comes from this rabbinical school, and my smicha. Well, we have the Messiah. His smicha. Where did his smicha come from? Two people. So John the Baptist had to know the Tanakh from beginning to end, have that memorized, and Jesus had to have it memorized. So two people who had smicha, because John was ordained, he was a Nazarite from birth. He was from the tribe of Levi. He was he was in the priestly he was in the priestly tribe, and he was a Naz, and he was a Nazarite, um, and he was a prophet of God. So he had his authority. It's a, like he has a, a mantle of authority on him, and then. There's Jesus and then God himself. He's the only person in the history of the earth that got his smicha from God. Right? So you'll see, you'll see when Jesus says, the rabbi's coming, by whose authority do you say these things? Where'd your smicha come from? He goes, I'm not going to tell you where it came from. <laughs> he goes, you don't, even, you don't even get to know where it comes from. But it came from John the immerser, the baptizer, and God himself at this very event. That's where, he got his, that's where he got his authority from. That's how come when he teaches things, you go, he's got authority. He didn't, now we go, well, he's got authority because he's the son of God. Yes. But he said, we must do this to fulfill all righteousness. Everything had to be done, Sadaq, in order. Had to be done in order. Because God makes the rules, but he doesn't break the rules. He makes the rules and then he follows them, Right? So he goes through all of those steps. <clears throat> so here in Mark 1.22, this is after the ordination in Mark. I think it happens in verse 9 in Mark. But here he's teaching, right? It says, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. What are scribes? Scribes are guys, uh, it's, a whole, it's a whole profession. Right? And the profession is to you you make you make your parchment, you tan a hide, you, you you know how to do all that. You make your ink, you make your pen, and they still do it to this day. It's called the sofer. Also begins with samech. Why? Because the book that you write or the scroll that you write gives support to your words. You go, hey, um, if I'm gonna write something, and here I'll put it down. Well I'll get it here in a sec. If I'm gonna write something. I'm going to forget it, so I've got to write it down so that supports what I thought, right? I can go back to it. So you never thought of writing as a crutch, but it is, right? And in Hebrew, it's the thought is there. So the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard it said, but I say to you. So what's he saying? The other teachers, the other rabbis, the other shepherds have said this and such. However, I'm going to tell you this. And he usually expands and goes a little bit further, right? So what's he doing? He's putting things, Sadeh, he's putting them in order. Right? So as he puts them in order, why? Because he's got the smicha with the samech ahead of it, the authority to do it. So these are sofrim, the scribes, the sofrim. Um, they are the ones who, who write down in the Bible. And what do they know? They know the commentary. So if you've ever seen a, a, a Hebrew commentary, you'll have the scripture in the middle, and then you'll have all these commentaries around it. Uh, they'll have Rashi. They'll have other different ones around there. And, uh, but that's what scribes would do. They would, they would write the Torah scrolls. They would write the Shema, the, the Shema that you put in the, uh, the, the, the things you put on your door. There's mezuzah. I'm trying not to use too many Hebrew words because so some of you might be lost on what, what's a mezuzah? What's this? What's that? So these little, the Shema is that little hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one and you stick it in there and you put it on your door. I mean, that's what a scribe does because those things have to be done a certain way. You can't just, you can't just like print it out on your computer and put it in there. That's, that's not the way they do it. And so uh, these guys were learned and in order to be a scribe, what do you have to know? You have to know all these little jots and tittles. Why there's a big Samech here and why there's a 
little, why there's a broken vav in the middle of the Bible, and why there's all these little things that you got to do when you're when you're ascribing things, and it all has to be done the exactly the same way. So these guys knew things, right? But what did the scribe not have? The authority to change anything. In fact, their entire their entire livelihood is based on them not changing anything, right? Right. So when this guy comes, he goes, I know. The Tanakh. I know the scriptures. And I have my authority from God himself. So I know the scriptures. I have my authority. I'm going to gather disciples to myself. And I'm going to train them the order of how to do things. Does that make sense? So what does this mean? I'll tell you exactly what this means. And this goes to... um, People, especially Christians who don't have this concept uh, in their mind, get really confused what Jesus is doing in the New Testament. They go, well, he's changing things. We don't have to do this or that because he's changed a bunch of things. Yes, and let me show you exactly what he changed. Uh, So we're coming back to our our Samech. How do you build one of those? What do you do? How, I mean, these, those little boys, you know, you think they ever had a, they had a little animal escape? Yeah, and they had an animal escape. It went and got torn up by a lion or something, and, and Dad yelled at him, right? <sighs> you got to figure out how to build a better support. i got to figure out how to build this enclosure better. So there's a specific way to do it. So, and you know if you're going to construct anything, there's a way. There's an order it has to go. You have to do it a certain way in order for it to be, uh, to fulfill its purpose. It's the same way with God's commandments. Uh, God's commandments, uh, they're all there, right? But some of them are pieces, and you have to put them together in the proper way. And you know, uh, the enemy is the master of putting God's commandments together in a way that is actually detrimental instead of positive. And people will think that they're doing something right when they're actually doing it all wrong. Because it's all in with the order that you put it in. So when the Messiah comes, he's going to put everything in the proper order and tell them why they should do it. and how. So he's going to train his disciples to build this hedge, this, this um, paddock for the benefit of the sheep inside. Because shepherding is just like leading people in God's word. There's, there's so many correlations with it. So how do you build one of those? So he's going to train the disciples in one of these. So guess what? So the teachers of Israel were called shepherds. Why? Because they built these. They didn't build them out of supports and, and thorns or, or, or stones or anything like that. What they built them out of was commandments. Fences. So they, so they erected what you might have heard that they erected fences around God's law, right? So God has instructions, don't go here. And they go, okay, so here's the edge. And we don't want people coming way up here and going, hey, that looks pretty, oh, you know, I'm going to fall off. So they go, we're going to build a fence here. I tell you what, we'll build it here. I tell you what, we'll build it here. So the hedge is over here. They're never going to get to there, right? It's meant to keep the sheep safe. However, if you add and subtract from God's commandments, you've built the fence wrong. You know, what if they built the fence and it actually went out over the precipice, right? And you go right up to the hedge and whoop, you drop through. That's not a good way to build that, is it? So... So that's what Jesus is saying. He says, you've built some of these in the wrong spots, right? People are going to get hurt. So what I want you to do is I want you to mend the fences and put them here. This is where I want the fences, the hedges to go, right? Then we'll keep the sheep safe and everybody will be good, right? So shepherds built hedges or fences for the sheep to keep them safe. So that's what Jesus is training the disciples for. And that's what's in, the, that's what's in when Jesus reorders something in here, he says, no, 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 no. You do this first, then that, and then this is how you go. Oh, you say that when I have to wash my hands? Uh, no, you don't understand the commandments. This is, that's not where the hedge goes. That's your tradition. Uh, we're going to put the hedge where God had it first. How about we do that? They go, oh, you don't listen to anything, right? That's what's going on. He is not changing God's instructions. Not one jot, not one tittle, not one iota. You know, that's where we get all that from. He's not changing any of God's instructions. What he's doing, he's changing where the hedges go. Right? So the traditions of the rabbis at that time, at that time, and now are hedges. So if you go to Orthodox Judaism, sometimes, according to the Messiah, they have the hedges in the wrong spot. Now, it's not up for me or you to say where they have the hedges and how to correct them. It's up to the Messiah to do that. Right? So, to follow Jesus and what he says, we try to put the hedges, we try to put the fences and the protections where he put them. 
Not, not where anybody else is, but where he put them. Because if he is the Messiah, then he has the right to order the, the hedges, the fences, wherever he sees that they're supposed to go. Right? And so the problem with then and now is that we have one group of guys going over here going, no, this is how you build it. And then you have Jesus the Messiah and God over here going, no, this is how you build it, guys. That's going to hurt people. <laughs> no, this is how you do it. In fact, you're wrong. No, I'm not wrong. This is right. Get him. You know, that's how, that's how it's going, right? So it's, that's what the traditions do. The traditions are meant to be hedges to keep people safe. But Jesus had the authority to change those hedges. He had the authority to put them where he wanted to. And so he's not changing any commandments or he's not changing the, the instructions of God. He's just putting them in the proper order. Okay? So, a samech now is like a circle. So take that one, lock it away. Got it? Okay, we're going to move on to the circle. So the 15th day of the month is a full moon. Remember when I said the ordinal count of the summit comes 15th in the alphabet? So the 15th day of the month is a full moon, which means that the moon is in a full circle. Just like a summit. Right? So you look at the moon and go, ah, summit, circle. It must be the 15th of God's biblical month. Right? It's, it's amazing. You just look up in the sky and you can see where you're at in time. It's very good. That's why God did that. So there's two major, now, now get this, you think this is a coincidence? There's two major holy days that fall on the 15th day of the month. Right? What are those two days? Well, I said I was going to mention them again. That's Passover or Pesach or Tabernacles or Sukkot. Right? So that's how you spell Pesach. See the circle in there? There's a Samech in the middle of there. It's Pesach. Right? Oh, look, this one begins with a Samech. That's Sukkot. Right? So, the Passover and Sukkot, is it a coincidence? They fall on the, new, on, on the full moon? They fall on the full moon, the 15th day of the month, right? So what happens on that day, that full moon day? Well, number one, we have the salvation from our sins, the Passover lamb who was slain for, the, for, for all of humanity. That happens on the Samach day. And then also on the Samach day, in, that's when God says, Emmanuel, God with us. He's going to dwell with us forever and ever in what? A sukkah, where he's going to surround us, protect us, and sustain us. Right? So, the, the Samech, right, it comes way out of it, but there's lots of cool stuff about it. And this is, and this is one of those things, and there's a reason why uh, I put this in here, because it's going to add up uh, here at the end. So now this is very interesting. Okay, file that one away. Got it. Got it. Okay, we're moving on. Okay. The acronym for the Samech. An acronym is the letters begin, right, with the first letter. Now, I'm going to spell it a, a little bit different than it was before, um, just so you can kind of see. That's a, that's a Kaf there at the bottom, right? And uh, I know Samech Mem Kaf. That's, wh that's what that is. So we have Salach. That means to forgive, right? Why? You need to forgive that they give someone some support. You're going to forgive them. That, that supports them, right? Okay, so the reason um, that this acronym is here, this is not something I made up. I didn't just like go through the, the, the Hebrew dictionary and go, oh, what kind of cool thing can I put together and think it's kind of neat? No, this is a known thing. This is, um, this is something that, uh, that Jews know and they, and they say these things, that this is what this acronym stands for because these are three ways that God supports us. One way that he supports us is to forgive us when we sin, right? What's another way that he supports us? That's a machal. It means he pardons our iniquities. He pardons what we do. And that supports us. And then what's the last one? It's kaper. It means to atone for. Which actually means, literally, it means to cover. The English word is atone. It means to cover over. Why? Because when we first sinned, we became naked. So we need a covering. So kaper means to atone, is a, is a cover, means to atone or to bring back together. Where now, we can now be in his presence because we have a covering for us, right? So this is salach, to forgive, machal, to pardon, and kaper, to atone, to atone or to cover the sins. And so I, I, did a little pic, I did a little picture with it, right? So we've got three supports right here, right? And those three supports are Salah, Machal, and Kaper. Boom, boom, boom. And you can see you put one through the middle, they're going to support a beam. And what do you have there? It's a Samech, right? You just flip it up, Samech. I don't know, I thought it was cool. Just a little something to 
locking the old brain there. So this is, the, this is a known acronym for this word, to, to forgive, to pardon, and to cover. So now I'm going to talk, how did this happen? How did, he, how did he support, sustain, and protect us? Well, let's talk a little bit about the curse. What's the curse? The curse specifically given to Adam here, and this is in Genesis 3, 17 through 18, and to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat plants of the field. Hmm. Why is that? Because God had a garden. There's a garden of God. And you just had to walk through the garden, and you just pick the fruit. You just pick the fruit, and you eat it, and it's really good. Oh. But now he says, now, in order to get what I'm talking about, you're going to have to work labor and toil for it. Now here's something interesting. The Garden of God, for, uh, if you're going to interpretate the, interpret the, interpretate, interpretate, <laughs> you're going to interpret the Hebrew Scriptures. Every few minutes you got to laugh. That breaks the ice. Okay. Every, if you're going to interpret the Bible, it's, there's a word, it's called pardes. Pardes means orchard. It's the orchard of God. But it's more like a field. Because it's work now. It used to be the knowledge of God. You just walked in the garden. If you had a question, hey, God, what's this? Hey, God, what's that? And he would reveal to you the secrets of the universe. Just give it away to you. Right? But now, since the curse has come, the veil has fallen over the thorns. And so now, you, in, in order to get your bread from the earth, in order to get your uh, uh, word of God knowledge, now you have to work for it. You have to work to get your daily bread in the Bible. Just, have you, just as you have to work to get your daily bread uh, out in the world. You see in the correspondence? So thorns and thistles. There's a curse. There's a curse. So we know that thorns are a picture of the curse of sin. Right? Because what did sin do? It separated us from the nourishment that was freely given and now we have to work for it. Just like the knowledge of God was once freely given and now we have to study for it. Okay? Oh, and I wasn't thinking about saying that. that that's... That's what I'm saying. That's on the fly. The sermon's coming out. It's kind of, kind of crazy. Okay. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. So let me get this straight. They took a circle of thorns representing the curse and they put it on his head. So let me show you where the Samech is coming up here. So they placed a crown of thorns on his head. Just like you would place your hands on the head of somebody that you're going to ordain or you're going to make king. But it, so, so what are they making him? So it's a crown of thorns, which means that the crown represents authority because it's his kingdom. And they, they lay their hands on him and they put the curse on his head. But what they meant to cause him pain what was it doing? It was providing a hedge against the curse. He was using the curse to protect against us being cursed. If you, if you get what Jesus did on that day on the cross, you will see what, what God is doing. So you have a circle, you have a samech of thorns placed on God's head. And so he has the authority by the virtue of his being king to take that crown and, and what he did for us they mocked him for it they beat him they put the, and they said oh if you're the king and they're mocking him for it you know if you're, if you're getting thrown insults right what makes them not stick when they're not true he's going he's wearing that crown of thorns he's going yeah you think you're doing this but I'm doing this for you I, I'm not going to get mad at you I'm not even going to be upset about it the reason why? Because I'm doing this of my own free will. You, what you are mocking at, you're going to be sorry you said those things. What you, well, if you understood what's going on here, you'd be on your knees before God. And hopefully you will someday. But right now, I'm going to walk through this. And I'm going to do it for you. I mean, that's the example. 
That's, the, that's what's going on here. And it's all related to that Hebrew letter, Samech. Because God wants to provide, to protect, to sustain us, and to support us. Even when we've sinned against him. Even when humans like us take a crown of thorns and put it on his head. He goes, that's okay, you can do that for me. And he's real humble about it. Because he knows that the end result is to support you. So he'll go through any amount of pain to support you. He'll go through anything in life to sustain you. Like a father would for a child. So let me show you something else. The priestly blessing. There's a samach in here, but it's hidden. You can't see it. It's not written in the letter, but it's a hidden samach. And let me show you how it is. It's called. It's the structure of the verse. Um, the reason that it's up here in Hebrew uh, is so that I can count the letters out for you. So you count the top row here. There's 15 letters. This middle row here, that is 20 letters. And then this last row here, that is 25 letters. Which equals what? That's quick math. 60 letters. Um, what, what's, what did the psalmic mean? What number was that again? Oh, it was 60, wasn't it? Okay. How many words are there? 15. There's 15 words. So there's the psalmic. It's And in Hebrew it says, Yevarechacha. Well... The Jews say uh, Adonai, but if you want to use God's personal name, it would be Yevarechacha, Yehovah, Vayishmerecha. Yair, Yehovah, Panavalecha, Vihunecha. Yisa, Yehovah, Panavalecha, Vaisemlecha Shalom. This verse talks about God wanting to support us and to surround us with his blessings. And this is what it says. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This is the most powerful blessing in the universe. This says, may the Lord bless you. Yeah? Yehovah v'yishmerecha, may he guard over you. May the Lord make his face, his countenance, is there, his face to shine upon you. May he, may he beam at you with his face. Right? The Lord lift up his countenance to you or lift you up. Like a father holding a, holding a child, smiling, lift you up and give you shalom. Make all the chaos go away. And what is that? That's God wanting to support us. So let's put this all together. Jesus was ordained to build a hedge of protection for us. You ever hear pray a hedge of protection around him? You're building a samech if you're praying a hemage, you know, a, a, a sukkah if you're praying a hedge of protection around somebody with a samech. Jesus was ordained. He got his smicha with the samech, his authority to build a hedge of protection for us, to follow the instructions, to put them in order so that we might be sustained. So during a full moon on the 15th day of the month, so there's a circle up in the sky and it's number 15 on the calendar. And where is he? He's wearing a crown of thorns because he's given the authority to remove the curse. That's what he's doing on the cross so that we might be blessed, supported and sustained from here and on out. Now, can you see how much God loves you? Can you see what he did for you? And, you know, sometimes somebody will do a gift and they'll do a rush job on it. You know, they'll just kind of throw it together and there's pieces missing and there's a little part of there. And, oh, I meant to do this, but that's not what God did for us. From the foundation of the earth, he put together a coded letter sequence, right? And on that letter sequence, there's this letter that shows what he's going to do to support us when the curse comes to take away our blessing. And he's going to reverse the curse and bless us instead. But to do that, he's going to go through those things on that day with that letter. And he's going to do it all for your blessing. It's written across the millennia what he did for you on the cross. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. It's absolutely amazing. So you should know 
no matter where you are, no matter what's going on, you are supported and sustained by God. And if you're not, all you have to do is go, man, I, I've blown it, right? I've, I've blown it. I've done things that I'm not proud of and I know God's not proud of, right? And he went through that for me to support me. So what is my reason for fighting him? What possible reason do I have to keep my heart hard toward this man, toward this God, when he would do this for me? What possible reason is there? Written across the ages is the story to bring you back into communi- to communion with him, to make you one, to, to, to cover you, right? To cover your sins, to bless you, and, and pronounce that blessing over you for eternity to come. So what should we do? Well, what we should do is give up everything in our life and to dedicate ourselves to such a person as this. To, to figure out what's in his mind. To do what's in his word. Right? So why do we love God? Because he supports us through everything. He supports us to make us whole and complete, lacking nothing. Not to be broken. Not to have the curse remain on us, the stink of it. Not to, not to constantly struggle with things. But God supports us so that we can overcome. That's what it says in Revelation. Blessed are those who overcome. Because that's what he's there to do. And learn to be sustained by God. He sustains and support, he supports you. And sometimes it's work. You know, getting the information out of here. That's because all the, the sin has clouded our vision as to what God really wants for us. We've got an enemy coming in trying to tell us all these different things. Right? Lying to us. Putting things out of order. So what's the cure? To work hard, to know how this God really is, to believe it, and to put it in practice. And then next, to live. Once you know how to be sustained by God, then you can be a support to others. Try and be a support to others when you haven't learned how to be sustained by God. It's like the sick helping the sick. You need someone well to help the sick. So know that you are supported. Learn that God is going to sustain you, and then you can then in turn be a support for others. Because this is exactly the same pattern that Jesus went through for us. He knew that God supported him. He loved him. He knew how to be sustained by God. He was sustained out in the wilderness by God for 40 days. No food or water. And so he knew how to, he knew how to provide the support for everyone else by dying for our sins. It's the same pattern. We just need to put it in practice in our own lives. So was that exciting? Was that a good sign? Yeah. Okay, well good. Well, let's, um, let's pray. And... Uh, as I pray and these guys come forward, I'll give you an opportunity to respond a little bit to what you've heard. Father, I just, I just thank you for all your loving support for your children and your people. If we would just turn to you and learn how to put things in the proper perspective and in the proper order. If there's anyone here today who needs you to sustain them, who needs, you, who needs to know that you support them, I pray that you would, you would be with them right now and through this week show them your support. Show them through your word how you will sustain them. And Father, once they've learned those lessons, or maybe they have learned those lessons already, show them how to help and support others and sustain them like you do. We're all just trying to learn from you who are the, you're the master of all. You're the master of everything that's good. And you can train us and teach us how to do what is right and good and pleasing in your eyes. I just pray that everyone here will take it to heart. And if there's anyone here who wants to pray and say, Father, I need your support, right? I know you love me. I know you supported me. The sermon, what, what Pastor said, I, I get it. I get the support that you give, and I love you for that. Now, I need some support right now. I need some support in my life from you so that I can go on, and not for myself, although that's good, but so that I can be blessed by you, and then I can in turn take what I know and learn and give it to others because... Blessings and support is not just to be hoarded and hogged. It's to be, it's to be put into our hearts so that we can then, in turn, uh, support others. And Father, I just pray that anyone here who's feeling that way, who has prayed that prayer, that you would enter into their lives and you would be with them and you would walk by their side and you would bring them into your kingdom where we will have everlasting support. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.